today we're going to start by focusing on operators in Java. And there's a lot of good news here because a lot of this is going to be really familiar to you. You're already familiar with operators from math class. So by operator, I mean things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Okay? Um, the plus symbol, the, the minus symbol, the, the subtraction symbol, those are all of our operators. In Java, there are more operators than just that, but those are the ones with which we're, we're already familiar. So just a couple of terms here. So when we're, we're speaking, we're on the same page with the right vocabulary. Operators are like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Operators perform operations on one, two, or three operands in Java. Okay? And that might seem odd, like we're used to two operands. Operands are the things, when we have two of them, on the left and right side of the operator. So when we say three plus seven, the operator is the addition, the plus symbol. Three and seven are the operands. What's it look like when you only have one operand? Well, think of like the, the negative sign. When I write negative 7, the operator is the negation operator. It's taking 7 and making it a negative 7. Okay? That only has one operand. There is one operator in Java that takes three operands. Not a fan of it, but we'll still touch on it next week. So don't worry about that at all for now. Operators perform operations on one, two, or three operands and return. They evaluate to some sort of a result of value. 3 plus 7 evaluates to 10. Right? Um, operators have precedence order, um, the order in which operators are evaluated. Great news here. In general, the precedence order in Java is the same as like every other programming language, more or less, and the same as like what you learn in math class, more or less. Okay? So all that stuff that you're familiar with still applies in Java. Um, they also have associativity. I think that's a word with which you should be familiar. In general, you never really need to worry about it. Just keep evaluating operations like you always have, and it will work out just fine. What associativity means is if we have multiple operators in the same expression that have the same precedence, do we evaluate them from left to right or from right to left? Okay. Um, what you're accustomed to is what you want to keep doing. Like, don't get tripped up by that. Don't even worry about it. It will work out just fine. So here's a table of the operators in Java that we're most concerned with. Um, there are many operators in Java. And there are many different levels of precedence. But we, that's like beyond the scope of this class. These are the ones we're primarily going to focus on. And I think the precedence is familiar to you, um, and the associativity is as expected. Um, so we're not really going to run into any issues here. Um, the unary plus and unary minus sound like new and fancy and special. That just means you put a negative sign in front of a number, or a positive sign to make it extra clear it's a positive number. That's all that is. And of course, that has like the highest precedence, because if we have like three times negative seven, we want to turn the 7 into negative 7 before we multiply it by 3. That's all that means. Um, as we're used to, multiplication division has higher precedence than addition and subtraction. Today we're going to focus on a, what, a potentially new operator that you haven't seen before, which is called the modula or remainder or mod operator. Um, I also want to point out in this table that the plus symbol shows up Twice for precedence three, addition is when we're adding like integer or double values. If we have two strings, then it's string concatenation like we studied in the previous unit. Okay? Same symbol, technically two different operators, but they have the same precedence. Assignment is the lowest precedence, which makes sense. If we have like x equals and then a complicated expression on the right side of the assignment operator, the equal sign, we want to fully evaluate that expression before we assign the value to the variable x. So that's why that's the lowest. 
We don't always think about assignment as an operator, but it definitely is. Okay. All right. Um, we're not going to write code together to do like addition and subtraction and multiplication um, because you already know how to do that. There's nothing special there. We're going to focus on two things when it comes to operators. We're going to focus on division because in Java, sometimes that behaves in an unexpected way. And then we're going to focus on the mod operator, the remainder operator, because that's probably new to at least most of you. Okay. So let's take a look at the code that we've been working on. So I'm going to open up Caesar Cipher. And Previously, we were focused on the final keyword, and so we defined some constants within the get complexity description method. And we're going to pick up from where we left off. So the whole purpose of this method is to build up a string that describes in a way that's easier for us to understand how long is it going to take someone with brute force techniques to crack our cipher? Okay. And rather than reporting, it's going to take like 3 million seconds because I can't hold that concept in my head. We're going to report it in terms of, well, how many years and days and months, um, not months, years and days and hours and minutes and seconds is it instead, which is going to be a lot more concrete for someone to understand. The first thing we need to do, though, is the parameter is how many seconds does it take for every guess? We need to calculate, well, how many guesses on average is it going to take for someone to crack our cipher? Um, and I wrote a method to do that for us. So there's this method, calculate average time to crack. And you're welcome to read through it if you're curious with how I, how I do this. It certainly makes some assumptions. Um, it assumes that the attacker knows the length of the key phrase and is basically going to try every possible key phrase of that length. Okay? If the attacker doesn't know the length of the key phrase, it actually makes it harder for the attacker. But we're going to assume they do know the length of the key phrase, they just don't know what the key phrase is. To be clear, this is a brute force approach, meaning the attacker is literally going to try, if the key phrase has six characters in it, we're going to try every possible combination of a six character key phrase. There are much better ways to crack the Caesar cipher. We're just not going to worry about those in the context of this example. Okay? So we just need to call this calculate average time to crack method. So going back up to where we left off yesterday, let's call this method and let's pass as a parameter our seconds per guess. And this method will return a long value, which we'll call total seconds. We're using a long here, and the method returns a long because maybe it's more than 2 billion seconds. Right? We want to watch out for that overflow that we were talking about. Here's something we haven't run into before. We know from the very beginning of this course that in general, we invoke methods on variables that refer to objects. And so here we want to call the calculate average time to crack method, but we need a variable on which to invoke it. Okay. This is a little different because the calculate average time to crack method is in the Caesar Cipher class. And the code that's current that we'll be executing in the com get complexity description method is also in the Caesar Cipher class. So really, we want to call calculate average time to crack on whatever object someone else called get complexity description. And so when we find ourselves in this position, sometimes we can feel stuck because like, we're like, oh, we don't have a variable. How can I have something dot calculate average time to crack? And when you feel that way, remember, we have a special variable called this, right? So here's another use of this. The value of this is always a reference to the object 
whose code is currently running. Someone somewhere called get complexity description. Actually, we did it inside of Caesar Cipher demo right here. Here's get complexity description. We called it on the cipher variable. The cipher variable refers to a new Caesar Cipher object that we made. We can't use cipher in here because that's not in scope. That's a local variable in a whole nother class. But we can say this. Okay, the value of this is going to be the same as the value of that local variable cipher. It's going to refer to the object whose code is currently running. I think that's worth a little comment because it's something we haven't seen before. So we can say one method in a class can invoke another method in the same class. We use this, or let's say we invoke the method on this. If you leave out the this, much like in other in cases with our instance variables, Java will figure out that you mean to call the calculate average time to crack method on this. It, it will do that automatically for us. I think it's helpful to be explicit. We're used to methods being called on variables that reference objects. Let's keep doing it. All right. Let's do our first expression that may be surprising. So let's create another local variable of type long called whole minutes. And let's assign to it total seconds, which the, whose value we just got from invoking that method, divided by seconds for every minute. And then let's capture some notes to understand what this does. Let's say hypothetically our total seconds, the value of total seconds is 125. Seconds for every minute is 60. So if we do 125 divided by 60, Java will evaluate that to 2. Okay? Which is often unexpected because it's not exactly 2. It's that Java automatically truncates the result because these are integer values. Okay? And this can definitely be, sometimes we want this behavior. In this case, we actually want the behavior. We want the number of whole minutes. But often we're surprised by the behavior and it leads to bugs. So let's capture it like explicitly what's going on. In this case, we want the behavior. We want to use what we call, oops, use integer division to calculate how many whole minutes are in the specified number of seconds. Okay. We want this behavior because if we have 125 seconds, it might be more meaningful if we report in our description string, hey, that's two minutes and five seconds. Oh, all right, I can wrap my head around that a little bit better. Yes. Exactly. Yep. So we're going to, ex exactly. We're going to pair integer division with the mod operator um, to get both parts. So the way in Java, integer division, which is like the slash slash operator in Python, so those of you familiar with Python, you're like, oh, yeah, 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 we've seen this. This gets a special operator in Python, which in my opinion is a much better way to do this than what Java does, but that's okay. Um, it discards the remainder. We say it truncates. So like as an example, 125 divided by 60 is 2.0833333, whatever it's going to truncate that to 2. Okay. So how does Java decide 
what type of division to do because unfortunately it uses the same symbol for both integer division and floating point division. Here's the rule. Java does integer division when both operands are integer types. And it does floating point division when one or both operands are floating point types. And what I mean by an integer type isn't necessarily just an int. It can be a byte, a short, an int, or a double. Those are all integer types. By floating point type, it's either a float or a double. Here are some examples. Let's make this super concrete. For example, 3 divided by 4 evaluates to, so 3, that's an int literal, 4, that's an int literal, 3 divided by 4 is 0 0.75, we get rid of the remainder and we truncate it, it evaluates to 0 because 3 and 4 are int literals. However, if we write it as 3.0 divided by 4, 3.0 is a double literal. So since one of the two operands is a double, Java will do floating point division and return a value of 0 0.75 because 3.0 is a double literal. Sometimes this behavior is exactly what we want, like it is in this example. Often this behavior is unexpected and leads to bugs. Okay? Um, and in fact, just earlier this year on the robotics team, where we also code in Java for the robot, something wasn't working at all. And we were doing integer division when we meant to do floating point division. And we were totally puzzled. Right? Something wasn't even running. Because I forget what we were dividing by, but basically we ended up with zero point something. And it got truncated to zero, and so it never even ran. Right? We're like, what's going on? It was so confusing. So keep this in mind when you run into weird bugs. Say, like, ooh, am I doing some sort of an integer division when I don't intend to? Um, also, I hate to say this, but keep this in mind when you're doing like AP multiple choice questions. They love checking if you can identify this pitfall on multiple choice questions. Um, there's always some question about integer division, right? I'm sure there'll be one on our upcoming exam. Um, so whenever you see that division operator in Java code, pause and say, wait, is this integer division or floating point division? The rule is simple. What makes it hard is just remembering to apply it. All right, that's our integer division. We often couple integer division, if we're doing like conversions, like we're doing here from seconds to minutes, we often couple integer division with the mod operator. So that, here's what that looks like. So let's create another local variable called leftover seconds. And that's gonna be total seconds mod seconds for every minute. The mod operator is the percent symbol. You may have studied this in math class, and if you have, it behaves in computer science in pretty much the same way. There's some slightly different behavior when we get to negative values, but in general, it behaves the same way. Um, several different names for this operator, so I think formally it's called the modulo operator. I usually just say mod, and I think that's what I hear most often. You can also hear it referred to as the remainder operator. All the same thing. So we're going to use this to calculate how many seconds are basically left over 
So again, if we had 125 seconds, we're like, oh, that's two minutes with five seconds left over. This gives us the five seconds left over part. So the mod operator, again, that's that percent symbol, it returns the remainder, remainder of the division operation. And by remainder, I re mean remainder in the sense of like old school long division, like, oh, it's two remainder five, right? I don't mean the fractional portion. It doesn't return like a decimal. Um, it returns like there are five things left over. Think back to like grade school division type stuff. As we've already identified, it can be very useful when paired with integer division. We will see that a lot. It's also surprising how many other applications and algorithms the mod operator shows up in. Okay. All right, since this is new, I think we need some practice. So I'm going to do one example, and then I'm going to leave several for you. If we have 7 mod 2, what does that evaluate to? All right, so 7, this is how I work through to my head. 7 divided by 2 is 3 with a remainder of 1. The mod operator returns the remainder, so this evaluates to 1. Three examples for you. Do 11 mod 3, figure out what that evaluates to. Then do 6 mod 2. And then do 4 mod 11. I'll give you a moment to do all three of those, and then we'll compare answers. All right, 11 mod 3. So 11 divided by 3 is 3 with a remainder of 2. The remainder always has to be less than the right operand. Right? You can't have more stuff left over than what we're dividing by. So 6 mod 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3 with a remainder of 0. There is no remainder. 4 mod 11, 4 divided by 11 is 0, so it's all left over, it's all the remainder is 4. That's how the mod operator works. So here we paired it with integer division. Another thing we do just as a side note here, so we often do like mod 2, is frequently used to test odd versus even. So if a value is odd, it will evaluate to 1. And if it's even, it evaluates to 0. So if we have some variable and we want to know if it's odd or even, we could do like x mod 2. If that evaluates to 1, hey, we know it's odd. Evaluates to 0, we know it's even. In a more general sense, we use this technique when we want to like do something on the nth iteration. So if we want to do something every five times, we could do the variable mod five. And if that equals zero, we know we're on a multiple of five. Okay? That's another place this shows up a lot. All right, so at this point, we know how many whole minutes we have, and we know how many leftover seconds. We want to repeat the same type of integer division in the mod operator to get the number of whole hours and leftover minutes and whole days and leftover hours and whole years and leftover days. And then we want to build up a really nice string that includes all this stuff together. That would be really tedious to type. So I posted a Canvas announcement. So if you go to our Canvas homepage and click on the most recent announcement, 
we're just going to copy and paste the next chunk of code in. Because we're really just typing almost the exact same thing over and over again. And so this is what it's going to look like when we're done. I think it's really helpful at this point for you to see like what does this actually look like when we run it and what type of a string do we actually build. Um, before we can actually run our test code though, we do need to write the constructor, which I skipped over previously. So let's scroll up to the top of the Caesar Cypher class and let's add the constructor. So good review. Visibility of the constructor is public. There is no return type. The name of the constructor is the name of the class. When we make a new Caesar Cipher object, we're passing one argument of type string, which is the key phrase. So we need to make sure we have a parameter here of type string. I'm going to call it initial key phrase. And we're just going to, for now, we're just going to say this dot key phrase equals initial key phrase. But I'm going to add a little comment here, which says revisit to compress the key phrase. So when we do the Caesar cipher, the key phrase um, can't have any, every letter in the key phrase has to be unique. And so Later this week, we'll write a method that ensures that, basically compresses the key phrase, gets rid of duplicate letters. Um, but for now, we'll just set it like this so we can run our code. So now we can actually compile Caesar Cipher demo and run it. And it wants to know, what's the text to encrypt? Um, this is my super secret message. I need a key phrase here. I'll make my key phrase unique. Not a great key phrase, but that's okay. I've only got six letters there. Let's say someone was trying to crack this cipher by hand. How long is it going to take them for a given key phrase to check if it actually worked? Let's say it takes them five seconds. I don't know. If so, it would take them 13 years, 51 days, 11 hours on average to crack the cipher. So that's probably why this was fairly effective in ancient Rome. It would take a computer a fraction of a second to do the same thing now. Okay? So again, don't use this for anything real, but here is our encrypted text. One side note, just of interest, one way that we can, even without using the computer, that we can crack the cipher much more efficiently is do something called frequency analysis. So if you just look at this encrypted message, something that may jump out at you is like, wow, there's a lot of U's. The letter U shows up a lot. What's up with that? Well, it probably means the letter U is being substituted for a letter that is really common in normal English, like the letter E, right? So by using frequency analysis, if you have a long enough encrypted message, you can very easily figure out the substitutions being used um, without going through the trouble of brute force cracking it. So just a little, a little side note. 